Okay, so good morning everybody. Good morning, mythology, animal behavior. Um, happy Wednesday. Uh, my name is Franya Shelley Greenland, and um, I am a graduate of the master's program in animal behavior and conservation So, at Hunter College. So I say to you all, you're in a fabulous place. Stay with this great program, okay? And I want to talk to you today about um, human, feline, and canine communication. Um, I am working right now as an applied animal behaviorist, so that means a lot of the theory and concepts um, I work in putting into practice. So let me talk to you a little bit about what this would look like. When we talk about communication, first of all, we have to start out by defining it. What exactly is communication? So, I'm going to talk about humans. What is communication for humans? Well, conscious or unconscious, a lot of stuff in this definition. And um, I will make these PowerPoints, the outline, available to your instructor. So if you want to get these notes, you'll be able to do that after the class. Intentional or unintentional process in which feelings and ideas are expressed verbal and or nonverbal messages sent, received, and comprehended. A whole lot of stuff going on there. And on a whole lot of different levels. Intrapersonal. That means you're communicating with yourself all the time. When you left your home this morning, if you thought, did I take my keys? You answer, right? Okay? If you turn around and you talk to the person sitting next to you, that's interpersonal communication. That's between two people. And then what happens if you're speaking to a group? Just like I'm standing up here talking to you. That's indirect. Now, when Burko's writing this back in the 90s, he talks about TV and, you know, radio. What else have we got going on that's indirect? That's a huge media. The Internet. What about communication? What are some of the components of it? Well, it's dynamic. It's a process. I'm standing here talking to you indirectly, speaking to you publicly, but your facial expressions, how you're communicating back to me, is going to change the process, okay? It's continuous. It never stops. You may be sleeping. You may be dreaming. You're getting all kinds of information from the environment. It's ongoing all the time. It is irreversible. You can't unring any bells. Once that bird starts singing, he can't take it back. That would be for, let me not get ahead of myself. We're still with humans here. Okay, um, interactive. It's between either with ourselves or our audience. And it's contextual. The way you spoke to your significant other or your friend this morning is not the way you're going to talk to your instructor, to your boss. Okay, all different, and also the setting in which you have that conversation. Way different at a party than when you're at home. What about culture? Well, culture really does affect how we communicate with each other, right? Shared system of interpretation. I started out by saying to you all that I, too, went to Hunter College, right? Now we share that system of interpretation when we talk about that kind of thing. New Yorkers. We, if I say subway to you, it means a whole different thing than if you were in Fresno, California, right? Your religion, your socioeconomic background, your politics. You're going to start from some place where you have a shared system of interpretation. You may interpret it differently as an individual, but you certainly look at it from one way as a culture. And our communication is dictated by culture. Okay. So that's some of the, um, what communication looks like when we start looking at it. What about the components of it? How do you do it? How do you send this information? And I should say that the information sending model is a very, very popular model. It's kind of giving sway now to a model where we say that we communicate, not necessarily to transmit information from sender to receiver, but we do it to influence the audience that we have. Kind of along the same lines, but different. Different enough that we can talk about it a lot and write a lot of papers about it. So you're taking these ideas and you're putting them in message form and you send them through a primary signal system. And that is going to be your senses. Seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and touching to someone who's going to receive them through a primary signal system. Okay? Now, noise. Noise can interfere with that. 
on either part. Now the noise does not necessarily mean the jackhammers that they're using to do construction or your elevator, is, uh, your escalator rather, is being repaired. It could also mean you thinking about what happened last night, you not being able to hear me. So noise is going to be any internal or external interference that is going to interfere with that message. You've heard this number before, I would imagine. If you haven't, you will. 93% of communication is nonverbal. Back in 1971, Albert Moravian does a study which, where he finds that, and, he's, and, and the study gets criticized. So, well, well, no, we don't necessarily know if we agree on that, but looks at responses to words and finds that people respond to 7% to the words, 38% to tone of voice, and 55% for body language. And that's where you get that 93%, okay? We keep looking at communication being mostly nonverbal. So much so that there are people that would say that what's written down, um, and let me just get that thing going, what's written down is something that should be a separate area of study. Because most of what we're doing when we're communicating, you can't really parse that stuff out, all right? Um, so we keep looking at this, and maybe um, how he did it or what he did, but we totally are going to be on board with most of communication being um, nonverbal. What does it look like? What does that mean if I say to you it's mostly nonverbal? Well, body movement, right? So DeVito looks at, um, kind of do this five different types of body movements, emblems. I'm standing on the side of the road, what do I want? I want to ride. It literally translates to what it is, right? Give what a chance. I don't have to tell you what that is. Like, you could also ask me how you're feeling, right? That's an emblem. Illustrator, go down that way. Um, affect displays, facial expressions that are going to show primary emotion. I smile, right? You know what, I fe what I'm feeling. A regulator. You're looking at me, and the way you look at me regulates my speech. If we were having a conversation one-on-one, -on -one, if you do this, I'm going to keep going, right? If you start to look away, you look disinterested, I might kind of slow down my speech. An adapter. You all may not recognize this dude over here, but that's Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. And what do you think Jimmy's trying to do there? He's trying to pick his nose, maybe. Kind of looks like he's rubbing it, right? So that would be an example of an adapter. More privately, he might actually go for it, but in public, he's not so much. I mentioned primary affect displays, or DeVito did, and we talk about these happiness, surprise, fear, anger, sadness, disgust, and contempt. And when we talk about these primary affect displays, we're going to say that um, we've looked at maybe We've identified, it. at this writing, there are 33 affect lens identified. There's probably more. Parts of our face are going to be more communicative than others in being able to uh, um, communicate those, uh, display those, demonstrate those, like the eyes and the eyelids for fear, okay, with the nose, the cheek, and the mouth for disgust. And again, it's difficult to separate the ability of the encoder from the ability of the decoder, the Vito says. So think about that too. So if I'm not looking, could that also be a form of noise? If, if Yes. If I don't look because I can't look, right, there's going to be many barriers that can um, separate that ability. And I can smile. I just smiled before, but was it really a genuine expression? Very interesting, this whole um, micro-momentary expression thing, where back in 1966, we started filming, or these researchers start filming these therapy patients. And you know, one thing about behavior, guys, it doesn't fossilize, no record, until you start recording it. And when you start recording it, now you can really stop and take your time to look at it. And Micro-momentary expressions were identified as these ex fleeting expressions lasting less than a half a second, 0.4 second, which would flit across a patient's face when they were talking about things in a therapy session. And there are some theorists that say, you know what? 
That's what you're really feeling, and you can't hide that, right? So, interesting that. All right, we are visual predators, right? Our main sense, our main way of taking in information in the world is through our eyes. Our eyes are right there in the front of our face. And with cultural dictates, so certain places in the world, it's not very cool to stare, right? Um, and in our culture, though we do, and our culture dictates that when we talk to each other, I look at you and then I look away, right? And actually, the length of gaze, if I'm looking at you, it's okay for me to look to you for up to three seconds, but when we're looking at each other, 1.18. And the more, we, we, we put all kinds of attributes to how long this gaze is going to be held. Are you interested? Are you not interested? Are you shy? I think all kinds of things as a result of it. Eyes are big for us. Very, very, very important. We use them to seek feedback, engage reactions, inform others when to speak, signal the nature of the relationship, right? And if anything, we can actually, I love this phrase, visual dominance behavior. If I stare at you, right? He's staring at me. I like that kind of stuff. To compensate for physical distance. And then there's eye contact avoidance. New Yorkers, most of you took the subway today if you didn't take the bus. If you're really lucky, you walked to school. But are, were you staring at anybody on that subway? Oh, no. Same thing on the elevator, right? So you use that eye contact to offer privacy to yourself or to others. Our pupils dilate when they're to let in more light. And it's mostly, we perceive it as a positive effect. Okay. So let's, when we talk about nonverbal language, let's also look at what about vocal. Paralanguage is the manner in which you say something rather than what you are saying. So in addition to stress and pitch, vocal characteristics such as rate, volume, rhythm, and other vocalizations and emotional sounds that you make crying, whispering, moaning. Another great quote. I love these great quotes. We are diagnostically oriented people, aren't we, though? We're quick to make judgments about another's personality based on paralinguistic cues. And sometimes, most of the time, guess what? We're that way because it works a lot of time, right? We, can, we will make judgments as to socioeconomic status, as to region. We're really picking up a lot on someone's speech. The rate of speech also determines credibility to the listener. Now we talk faster, we're New Yorkers, can you tell? However, you know, my rate of speech, the faster I talk, the more you're going to tend to think that what I'm saying is credible. She knows what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. Nonverbal spatial communication, proxemics. Edward Hall does incredible work, starts us out on this, how do we use space? Most of your towers, the big old towers in New York are designed looking at, you know, how the uses of public space along this. And he talks about the distances that we use, whether we're aware of them or not. Intimate distance, um, personal distance, social distance, and public distance. Again, this is going to be dictated by culture, where you are from, okay? So, in certain cultures, it may not be acceptable for you to stand that close to somebody who is in a higher position than you are. In other cultures, it may be very acceptable to, for you to be very close to people at all times. In other cultures, it may be different for different genders to touch and in other cultures not. So when we look at this, we really do have to be aware of the environment, make it contextual of what's going on with it, but it's still very powerful. Okay. So I talked to you about human communication, kind of just want to give you a little bit of a touchstone there with that. But what about non-human? How does it compare? Because you're not sitting here to learn about this, right? But you got to start with it. Um, it's not species specific. How we process it and employ it as distinct species and individuals is. Now Forrester, I started you with Burko's definition of communication for humans. If we talk about Forrester, this is a primate study. Just does this sound the same or very similar? Any act by which an individual gives or receives information about needs, desires, perception, knowledge, 
or effective states through intentional or unintentional means via visual, tactile, or auditory signals. This transfer of information can be directed at the self, a social partner, or an object of the environment. Sound familiar? So, let me just say we don't know what we don't know about animal communication. <coughs> You want to really be careful when you start looking at communication to avoid anthropomorphism, big word, giving, non, giving human traits to non-human animals. That cat is nasty. That dog is stupid. Right? That fish is really dumb, too. <laughs> Anthropocentrism. We're the center of the universe. It's all about us. We need to know when we look at animal communication that there are species specific differences. How we process and experience the world is, is really goes to our sensory capacity. How a dog, dog's primary sense is olfactory, taking in information through smell. The cat is hearing, all right? Um, echolocation, you're not getting around like a bat does or a dolphin does. You don't know how they experience the world. So what about speed of cognition, too? That's another thing that's very interesting. Alexander Horowitz talks about uh, the flicker fusion rate with dogs, how they take visual information in and they actually process it a bit faster than we do. One of the reasons why they never like to watch analog TV, but they, they're okay with digital. Slotnikov talks, he does a tremendous amount of work with uh, prairie dogs. And he has this great book, if you haven't read it, I urge you, Chasing Dr. Doolittle. Another assumption he says that we make when we look at the communication system of animals is that the time scale of their signals is exactly the same as the time that we perceive. For example, a bird makes a vocalization that sounds like the squawk does. We assume that another bird perceives the squawk exactly the way we hear it. But what if the receiving bird had a different scale of perception? And the squawk actually was registered by the bird's brain as a long communication, equivalent to our sentence or paragraph. Now I've mentioned to you film as our abilities to parse out, to analyze the, uh, what is put out there in the environment progress, we are going to find out much more. So we now can analyze sounds in an amazing way that we never did before. When I was going to Hunter and I was doing my master's in animal behavior, one of my classmates did a project, did a research project on contact tamarins at the Central Park Zoo and recorded the sounds and came back and was able, because we have equipment that does that now, to pick out sounds that we weren't hearing before. We didn't <coughs> even know they were making those noises because we didn't hear them. So just because we're not seeing it or hearing it, uh, this looks like a piece of white paper, right? Well, if you were a bird, you'd see all different kind of colors on this, right? They have a whole way of looking at spectrums. All right, so we have only limited understanding of the nuances of animals' lives, of what is important to them, of how they perceive the world around them, but we make assumptions based on our very limited knowledge. We need to realize we don't know what we don't know, and we should only talk about what we do know, right? What we can observe. What about, well, I'm going to talk to you about cats and dogs. I want to just briefly talk to you a little about, about the fact that they're domesticated animals, right? And we picked domesticated animals for a reason. Um, Galton's writing back in 1865. He's related to Charles Darwin. And he talks about why do we pick these animals? You know, they have to like us. They have to um, be uh, comfort loving. They are going to be useful. They should breed freely. Breed freely. The pig that we picked to domesticate, we picked that species of pig because it has more piglets when it gives birth than another species that was just as good in terms of that. And they should be gregarious. And I kind of want to I like what he says about cats. He says the cat's not really gregarious, not really social and easy to take care of, but you know, it's it's retained by its extraordinary adhesion of the house in which it's weird. It really likes, you know being home, being on the couch, you're kind of an adjunct. I don't know about that, Francis, but we'll, we'll stick, we'll, we'll hold it. Um, so we talk again about domestication. I want to mention it here because 
cats and dogs. Who's more domesticated? Clearly it's going to be our dog. Been with us for a much longer period of time. Um, but we kind of tend to do this dogs or wolves thing, and you know, they're really not, but we like the way that sounds for some reason. Um, and we do see a divergence in a breeding phase once we, there's two, uh, Circles talks about there being two phases to domestication. We first start keeping animals, and then we start to really select for different things with them. And then there are things that we get when we didn't even try to select for them. We get um, changes in coloration, more piebald and white. So in other words, you don't get this camouflage that a lot of animals will have living in a natural environment. Think about your tabby cats compared to your orange and white kind of Marmaduke cats, right? Marmaduke's not, not standing a chance if he gets out into the jungle. Um, changes in leg length, body size, smaller heads, smaller brains, floppy ears, and curling tails. We didn't pick for that stuff. It kind of just came along on the genes. So are they really different? Well, it's, I would say to you that when you look at this, you kind of have to look at where you are along that length. However, Jensen says that only slight dissimilarities are going to, you're going to find. Only slight. And that there may be behavioral differences, but we've selected for those. So when, you, when I talk to you about dogs, we talk about fear thresholds. When we talk about barking, wolves don't bark. Okay? Wolves also don't stare at us the way dogs do when they want to get the ball underneath the couch. Okay? So you're going to see some changes, but it really is, they're, they're very similar to their ancestors, most of the time. Okay. So, now that we've laid some groundwork for what communication is, and um, who we're talking about with our cats and dogs, how do we begin to effectively communicate with these other animals? Well, I talked to you a little bit about domestication, but you've got to go back to the animal in its natural environment. You have to start with natural history. Then you have to identify and recognize what's going on with the communication. You have to learn species-specific differences. Cats are not dogs. Dogs are not cats. Um, and they're individuals. They're going to be individuals based on their own <coughs> heredity, on their own environment, on their own personalities. Look at what's going on in that environment. And then, if it is possible, replicate. How do you replicate? Um, Circle says it's really only been domesticated for the last 150 years because of it going in and out of different phases of domestication. But I will tell you what's interesting about this is that you look at the African wildcat and you look at the European wildcat and the African wildcat, again why? Go back to Galton. The African wildcat is more territorial and more docile. So this is the ancestor that we have identified as being the ancestor of our domestic cat. Um, first species domesticated solely for the purpose of controlling pests. I put that up there, right up there in the front. Why? Because we didn't get them to go hunting with us, right? We, they could, as we become the the theory goes, if we become this agrarian society, we settle and we start to have stores of grain. The Egyptians, right, need to have the cats there to get rid of the rodents. So they're not really working that closely with us the way that dogs are. Um, they, and also, how do they live their lives? They're obligate carnivores. They must eat meat. They, must, they get their nutrition through meat. Biological dictate. They're hunters. We say cats are not social, look in their natural environments, it ain't so. Um, you do have gregarious living situations, always going to be in biology when you talk about plentiful food sources. You've got to have carrying capacity, right? You have to have the land has to be able to support who's on it. But when we talk about lions, cheetahs, and domestic cats, they are living in social groups. For our cats, we find those social groups to be mostly comprised of females, related females, and they're doing group maternal care, okay? And cats' uh, senses, how are they perceiving the world? Highly developed sense of hearing, they hear way better than our dogs do, all right? 
sense of smell, vibratory to perception, those whiskers, vibrace that are on a cat, <coughs> really um, help them to do what's really important for them, hunt. If they're tracking a mouse or a mouse happens to be nearby, they're feeling where the mouse is in space through whiskers. And if you've, if you've ever had, if you have a cat and you've ever put, had it um, come back from the bed and they give you one of those little um, e-collars, those little bee thin collars, can that cat walk with that collar? It kind of looks like he's drunk. Why? Because the air is no longer going around those whiskers. An element of proprioception of finding out where that cat is in space and objects are in space for that cat. Dogs. Lots of information out there as to where these guys came from. Darwin started saying they were related to the jackal. Well, we've done a lot of going back and forth on this, and we are kind of holding with the gray wolf. But I need to tell you that we're talking about mitochondrial DNA. That's the one that doesn't decay, and that's matrilineal. It comes from the wolf's mother, or the dog's mother. So we know that we have evidence, strong evidence, for um, maternal um, DNA, mitochondrial DNA, matrilineal genetic evidence for the gray wolf. No argument on that one. Who dad is? Differing theories as to where and when, but with most of our agreement, at, um, we're going to say 15,000 years ago. All right. Now. There are different theories as to how this happens. Does the wolf come in from the wild? Well, certainly, Raymond Coppinger does this, comes out with this great theory, and you really can see it in different parts of the world if you go to Mexico, if you go to India. Um, dogs are certainly opportunistic scavengers. Um, they come closest to us in, order to, in, in different environments in order to be able to feed off of the food that we're not eating anymore, i.e. garbage. You go to Mexico City, you look at the dumps, there's a huge problem with rabies in India right now with wild dogs and with refuse because what these dogs are doing is they're eating the garbage that we're leaving behind. And the ones that are going to breed and the ones that are going to reproduce are the ones that can get closer to human beings. Okay? So this is certainly a, a theory as to how your domestication event would occur. And when we look at how they live in a natural environment, they are again not wolves, they're living in groups social groups where, you're, where it's transitory in nature and who's going in and out. Highly developed sense of smell and hearing. We do know that the dog, and let me just talk to you, well, I'm going to talk to you at some point about eye contact. The dog will look at us, cats will look at us. It's direction of gaze, intensity of gaze, and what the gaze means that is considered adversarial for um, most animals, including us. Remember we talked about that dominance thing with gaze, but much more so for them. Bonnie Beaver. Bonnie Beaver um, writes a book for um, behavior for veterinarians, and she says interspecies species communication takes three major forms, vocal expression, body posture, and visual or olfactory marks for most animals. Body language is the primary messenger. Uh, chemical communication is often underappreciated, right? And she says, and this is what she says, that different species are generally not considered to have the innate ability to understand the communication of others. So Bonnie starts talking about, we talked about vocalizations, what do cats do? And Moloch, who's writing back in the 40s, <coughs> talks about how the functionality, how is the cat's mouth held when it's making these different vocalizations. We are a Western, so we like to, we're going to categorize this, so we're going to, and what, that's what we do, and we, um, come up with different murmur patterns. And you can start to, to see when, how the mouth is held and when these sounds are made, what's going along with it in terms of behaviors. So if you look at the vowel patterns where the mouth is first to open and regresses to close, anger wail, bewilderment, complaint, demand, mating cry, Siamese, they have their own vocalization apparently, they qualify for that. And ultrasound. Wolves really don't bark and dogs do, right? Wolves bark very um, rarely. So what we find with the barks is that, first of all, we select it for them. The dog didn't just say, I want to bark. We want our hunting dogs, our guard dogs. We really looked for barking dogs. 
and barks are attention getting behavior and when we look at barks we really can tell um, we look at the context in which they're made and then we kind of can parse them out or if you've been around a lot of dogs and you pay a lot of attention your first way to do research with observation is you can pick up on this too um, did study in Hungary stranger barks are going to be the lowest in pitch and the harshest they're nearly spat out they have the shortest interbark interval then you get isolation barks, higher frequency, right? Oh, you really need help. Um, and play barks, high in frequency, but coming one right after another. They're not as elongated. Okay. So, Horowitz says, and that's another fabulous book. Um, I, I have references on this, uh, on the notes on here. So, please feel free to investigate more. Given the relative scarcity of barking in wolves, some theorize that dogs have developed a more elaborate barking language precisely in order to communicate with humans. That and we also helped by selecting for that, right? Um, I said cats have a wide range of vocalizations. They are known to meow more around humans than other cats. Also, some, we've got evidence for that, research-based. This is likely in response to our own verbosity and most humans missing much of the nonverbal communication exhibited by the cat. Meowing certainly serves the purpose of being attention getting for food or contact or other requests. So we talked about vocalizations, right, and then we talk about body language and this, uh, this is Beaver again. We, if, if you see this cat up here, right, this Halloween cat, everybody's like, oh, I'm really scared of that cat. Should you be really scared of that cat? That cat is trying to look much bigger than he really is in order to get you to go away. If that cat really wanted to get you, he would like lie on his side and use all those, uh, those claws at his disposal. Can't do much fighting in that position. Fighting is costly from a biological standpoint. A whole lot of uh, body language used to stop it from happening. A lot of display, a lot of highly ritualized behaviors, right? Um, kind of can do this with cats or dogs. We can even do this with humans. Make a big category of distance increasing postures or distance reducing postures. And we can look at the tail with the cat. Um, how are they holding the tail? Tail up. And especially tail up is very friendly, very, very affiliative. We study in a Roman cat colony. Look at the tail with these friendly affiliates with each other, and then it's where's the tail tip? If it's going towards you, they really like you. So you, you didn't know they were saying that much stuff. Um, so I talked to you about eye contact. If you look at distance increasing postures, we find that direct eye contact with constricted pupils, not just going to be the eyes, it's going to be everything else. There's a whole host of things that are going on there, but for the eyes, it's, it permits, the, it blocks all movement by the other cat. What, what will frequently happen with eye contact with cats, that direct gaze can hold another cat in abeyance, but if they look away, it, it's also a green light to go forward. Okay. Kessler and Turner in 1999 go into a cattery and they do a tremendous amount of work, and this is a really big study. Um, and the ASPCA does a lot of work with it, and so do other organizations. And they kind of come up with, we're going to chart and we're going to look at every aspect of a cat's body. <coughs> so we're going to talk about from body tension, where the body is held, in, where, the, where the head, excuse me, is held in relation to the body, where the legs are, where the tail are, where the whiskers are, where are the eyes, what are the pupils like, where are the ears. You can't just talk about what this, what's happening with, oh, their mouth is open, their teeth are bare, they hissed, right? So, and, and P.S., Jumping back to hissing for a second, his, hissing is is really a very basic kind of don't be concerned. Cat's just expressing that he feels uncomfortable. That's one of the first sounds kittens learn, right? To hiss, to make hisses. It's okay. Just don't do whatever it is that you're doing that are getting them upset, and they'll be fine. All right. So Kessler and Turner take us through these uh, uh, what's happening with the cats and what they were looking at really is in a they, they're in England they're looking at homed cats that are in a cattery in a overnight in a boarding situation as opposed to free living or feral cats and they're saying how do they react 
and what's going on with them. And what kind of cats I'm trying to find out is the cats that are more uncomfortable or what? <clears throat> are a lot of the homed cats, depending on individual differences. Talk to you about the ASPCA. They do a tremendous amount of work. They're pulling from literature all over in terms of body language. And when we talk about body language, um, especially with cats and dogs, we really need to look at the whole picture. Dogs certainly, we're going to, we can pay much more attention to mouth and face. Why? They have more muscles in their face. They don't have as many as we do. We're primates. But they ha certainly have very flexible, mobile faces. Unlike that cat, which is not inscrutable, just can't make those same faces, doesn't have the muscles. Okay? Got some big eyes and some huge ears that can turn around and has many more muscles in its ears, 50-something compared to our less than five. But definitely, when we're talking about dogs, you, the face is going to be tremendously informative in terms of expression. So, um, and here, I don't know how well you can see this, but you've got a uh, smiling dog, and then you've got a dog that's doing a warning uh, with the mouth. And there's different, and both of those dogs are showing you their teeth. Do they both mean the same thing? Absolutely not. What you kind of would see if you could see this better is that with the, with the warning, it's the, you're going to see more teeth, the muzzle is going to be retracted further back. You're going to see wrinkles along with it. You're going to see differences with the eyes, too, more now. Harder eyes. In this picture, I don't know if it really comes out very well, but that whale eye where you can see the white of the eye kind of thing going on. And then there's so much more, again, um, <coughs> ears, tail, and overall body posture. And I talk, and ears. You have a beagle. Can you tell the same with that beagle as you can with um, the American Staffordshire Terrier? <coughs> they both move their ears. Harder for you to discern those. So there are arguments that are made that by the kind of selection that we've done with breeding the dogs um, that we have, that we've kind of cut down on their ability to communicate with each other. Um, we, we crop ears, we, we, we dog tails, we do different kind, we breed them so that they look like different, um, and they don't really have full use in a lot of those things. But I will tell you, I, I happen to have a Cocker Spaniel, you'll see her picture up here. I can see her move her ears. You look at the base of the ear, they still move them. Not as easy, you gotta pay attention. So, sweat, overall body postures and movement, it are also going to go into the body language that we have with dogs. And these, these, do these two dogs over here are doing this. This one dog is doing a play bow where you, it, to initiate play. That's a very ritualized behavior. I would like to play. All right, so we talked about vocalization. We talked about body language. And then we said, what about the, that chemical communication? Visual or olfactory? So we know that cats like to rub on things. Probably, we don't know why. We can guess for some reason. It probably feels good. They, they, I'm sure they're doing it because they like it. Just because there's a functionality doesn't necessarily mean that it can't have other things that go along with it or can't serve more than one purpose. Um, with the rubbing behavior, though, we see that we know that they have, they have these glands that are located temporals on the temples and can, uh, the ear canals um, at the base of the tail. And so you're going to have secretions that are going to be deposited along with those when they rub. Rubbing or bunting, this very um, focused way they have of coming up to affiliates, and if you have a cat and a cat does it to you, it's also a very affiliated behavior, is another way to communicate. Cat does scratching. The cat is not scratching to, even though we have these, uh, we know that there are um, glands in the, around the pads of the feet and that they may be leaving scent, other cats aren't necessarily interested in so when we do studies and we look, we say, the other cats aren't smelling that. So we may think, oh, they're putting scent there, but the other cat's not interested. So you know, they may just have the scent, and we're kind of thinking, Beaver says, that it's more um, visual, because they pay attention to where the scratching is. Excrement marking, unlike dogs, when a cat urinates as, as a marking behavior, especially with your intact males, your tomcats, they don't want to cover up anyone else's urine. They just want to leave theirs. 
So it's a very strong pungent odor if you've never smelt it, and it's there to communicate all kinds of information. There's a lot of chemical components in there. You don't really see the same thing with feces. They kind of tend to cover their feces, but we do see scenarios with free-ranging cats where they will leave feces out next to really good hunting trails. Right? This is my territory. I don't know if they say that, but... Dogs. So, two main methods of, of the disposition of scent in the environment. Feces, urine, and anal sac secretions when they are relieving themselves or even when they're not like with the raised leg lift with the dog, with the male dog, and distinctive body odors of individual dogs. So when in, in, along with those secretions, they have their own individual odors. Males and females are doing this overmarking behavior. So your females can urinate frequently too over the urine of another dog. Don't know why they're doing that ground scratching thing when they go, um, <coughs> they, they kick up their back legs. Different theories as to why this is happening. Not really sure, okay? Species specific differences. Cats are not little dogs. Dogs are not big cats, right? So when we start to look at them, how are they experiencing the world? What's their social organization like? The primary sense I talked to you about. Um, so, um, this is more a welfare thing, but just I really got to get in really quick about how you should let the dog sniff around when he goes for a walk. Why? Because you know he needs to smell everything. That's how they're that's how they're getting information in on the world, and that, and that's what makes them also different than us in how they communicate. Dogs are amazing in that they kind of co-evolve with us, so they do look at us, but it's not their primary sense. It's not how they're taking in the world. Presentation, I talked to you about mobility, about how um, they are able, what, it, what, what are you seeing? Also, when we talk about species-specific differences, um, shorter period of domestication with them, and how they are hunting, how they're getting food, and so on, and so on, and so on. You really have to look at each um, animal as a different species. Individual differences in context. All animals are individuals. So if we're going to see what's going on, and if I want to know what's going on here with these two dogs, do they know what they're doing with each other? Absolutely. Do you know what they're doing with each other? Well, you might be able to guess that this, and notice nobody's staring at anybody directly. That little dog, that's a little French bulldog, I don't know how well you can see this, but that little French dog is looking like that bigger, looks kind of like this um, lab mix, um, looking at this dog, and the dog's looking away. And then we've got this, this is that play bow that we saw before, all right? And I want to tell you something, you see it in their own behavior. There's no frontal, we're frontal, we're primates. They're side to side with each other. Look at how they are with each other. Not when you're pulling on them and when they don't have control over it, but how they will interact with each other in a natural way. So. This guy gets down with this play bow, and again, he's looking away, and you have this kind of, this is called self-handicapping. <coughs> he's much bigger, but he would really, really, really like to play with that little dog, maybe, right? They totally know what's happening here, and good for them. Whoever's attached to them, let them do it. So, is, can, you, can we figure this stuff out? Well, Beaver says, humans can learn many feline signals, understanding and communication, so then we can communicate, right? Because we can, if we want, if we learn what they're doing, we can communicate. Jensen says um, these signals can be conveyed by dogs to other animals and humans. The latter, and that would be the humans, that would be us. However, are not always adept at accurately interpreting many of the more subtle behavior cues, and this lack of understanding can, in some unfortunate situations, culminate in bites and other injuries. They're telling you to back off. They're telling you they're scared. They're tell and you know, you're just going to force them, right? And they're going to fight because they've got to protect themselves. So if we talk about putting this together, we can talk about putting this together in a way that you're going to approach <coughs> in a way that is going to be friendly for them. So if we say the cats sniff nose to nose um, and they rub along their face, of each of another cat, that's where you should be putting your hands, not over their entire bodies. 
right? That's not how they do it with each other. So, social, so when we see these cats coming together, the facial approach most commonly involves the mouth, the temporal region, touching noses and areas of tactile hair and rubbing. So you're, so that's just a lot of words to say what I just said was if they interact with each other by nose touching and rubbing along facial areas, if they will come into our hands when we touch them in that manner, that is the way we should be interacting with them because that's the way they interact with each other when they're friendly. Do cats rub along the side of each other? Yes, they do. We didn't see this originally when we first started looking at cat behavior. It happens very quickly, and it only happens with affiliates. So if I just met your cat, it would be way too much too fast too soon for me to start rubbing along its body. Not nice, okay? Direct stares are adversarial, but cats do use eye contact, and blinking is actually an affiliative behavior with cats, all right? Think about the sounds that they make. You're going to use a different voice around a cat than you would around a dog, right? They do this sounds with each other. They have, they, they're very, very vocal around us. But you also have to modulate your voice too, because what, remember, big sense of hearing there. Loud music, very painful for a cat. Classical music, very nice. <laughs> Again, look at how the cats are interacting with each other, all right? It, we keep seeing that approach, that, that face that's coming next to each other. You, you don't really see a lot of this rubbing. Conflict-related postures, again, are going to be about distance increasing, <coughs> threats, display. <coughs> Dogs. Again, side approaches. Nobody's leaning into anybody's face. Nobody's staring at anybody. Nobody's alpha rolling, okay? No one's being the pack leader. It's not happening. That's not what they're doing with each other. Um, this staring that we do with dogs, if dogs break the rule of the staring, they get themselves into trouble. Confusion can often arise if a dog continues to be stared at despite having already broken eye contact. So when you keep staring at a dog and it doesn't want you to, then you're forcing it to go to the next step, baring teeth and snarling. So when you look at greeting behavior with dogs, you, do not, you see them, it is the safest thing for them to do to explore each other in a linear way and to sniff the back of each other. That's how they, get communi that's how they communicate with each other. That's how they get information. It is not gross. It is how they do it. It means something completely different to them than it does to us. I'm not asking you to do that. <laughs> I am simply saying to you that what you should do, though, is be very aware of. When I say replicate if possible, that means you're not, you can't go there and sniff a dog's butt, but you can certainly go up to a dog <coughs> from the side, right? You can certainly not stare at the dog. You can certainly talk to the dog in a very happy voice. So there are things that you can do if you know, the, if you know your subject organism. So, it's a little story that I write about where I talk about how I go to one of the pet stores, and you know, I love pet stores, they're great, but, but what tends to happen in pet stores is, you know, you go in the pet store and you ask the guy there for all the advice, right? What's the best leash, what's the best collar, what's the best food, all that kind of stuff. They know some stuff, they do, more stuff than others. But then they get to know me, and one of the owners of this pet store says to me, he's, his girlfriend moved in with him, and she has this little white dog, and the dog's name is Fluffy. <coughs> so Fluffy doesn't like me. I said, why do you say Fluffy doesn't like me? He says, Fluffy never listens to me, he doesn't like me. And he's not happy about Fluffy. And P.S., Fluffy knows it because Fluffy's peeing on the couch. That's <laughs> what's happening. It's not, this is not getting better. So I said, well, how are you, what are you doing? You're trying to, he explains to me. And how do you know Fluffy doesn't like you? Well, when I talk to Fluffy, I sit down with him and I try to talk to him. Fluffy turns away. He won't pay attention to me. He won't look at me. So I said, well, when dogs look away like that, that's because they're trying to take the pressure off. It's a stress response. A dog actually looking away from a scenario or turning away from something is a stress signal. Um, Somebody once called it a calming signal. They definitely do do it, though. If the dog could, the dog would leave the room. But 
if you look at that and you think that that little dog, that Fluffy, was being a human and wasn't looking away because he wasn't interested and not paying attention, you would be giving Fluffy all the wrong attributes. But if the owner realized that Fluffy was looking, was not looking at him because he was feeling pressure or he was feeling stressed, and then he probably, and I didn't ask this, but it was probably like, Fluffy, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Fluffy really doesn't want to look then, right? But then maybe you might modulate your tone of voice, maybe you might give Fluffy a break. Maybe there might be other things that one could do with that. So um, I know that you have questions for me. So that's, that's uh, my presentation. I also, um, if you're interested, please, I, I, I'm going to leave cards up here. I have a website, got a lot of great information along this. And I also have a book about cats and dogs that's um, out there as well that just came out earlier this year. So that's my talk. What are your questions for me? Not everybody at once. One at a time. What when a cat wants to play? So he calls you, and when you come, you just stop moving. Okay, but so if the cat, you, how do you know the cat wants to play? Well, it has the, um, the same thing on the picture, like he's on his back, um, he's meowing. So maybe just, so it's really hard to give a goal or a motivation to another being, right? Mm -hmm. Mammal or human or any other being, period. So we really don't know why um, that animal is acting that way. You can try a number of different things. Maybe that cat just wants you in the same room with him. When it comes to cats, so let me talk about cat and play really quickly. One of the biggest ways to increase um, our um, interaction with cats is to play with them. We kind of play with dogs, don't we? Take a walk, throw a ball, get them a squeaky toy, play tug of war. You do all this stuff, and then what do you do with the cat? Nothing. So play with your cat. If you really want to change the um, relationship you have with a cat or to enrich your cat's life, Play with your cat. And play with your cat with like a fishing wand toy where you're actually going to get something where the cat can interact with it, with you attached to it. I'm not talking about the fact that you gave him, he's got fur mice and he's got a ball and you know, he's got catnip and he's good, he's got a scratching post. You, just like you would do it with the dog. Fishing wand toys are great. You have to approximate prey with them, not you. You're going to take the object and draw it across him or away from the cat's line of vision. Get the cat engaged with it, and the cat will respond to that. Try that with your cat.